Hey, 42 here. Although, this episode is actually about not being here. We're going to reveal the secrets that help the most high-performing people in the world achieve extraordinary things by tuning out of reality and accessing altered states of consciousness. But first, a test. Imagine dawn on the edge of the savannah a hundred thousand years ago. You are a homo sapien, awoken by the sun and prepared to fight another day. As you leave the shelter of your cave to fetch water, you suddenly freeze. Behind the nearest bush, you spot an indistinct brown mass. Do you, A, assume it's a rock, chuckle at yourself for getting a fright and carry on with your morning, or B, assume it's a saber-toothed tiger, soil your loincloth a little and reach for the nearest spear? The answer is B, and regardless of what you may tell yourself, you had no choice in that decision. Your brain already made that call for you before you consciously saw that brown shape behind the bush. This is thanks to negativity bias, a survival mechanism that evolved to keep us alive by assuming the worst and making it easier for your brain to recall negative experiences than positive ones. It's easy to understand why this trait exists. Let's say you, early human, saw a brown mass and assumed it was a saber-toothed tiger, but later discovered that it was, in fact, a rock. Sure, you would look a bit like a fool in front of the rest of your tribe mates and have to endure nicknames like Leaky Loins, but at least you'd be alive. But if you saw a brown mass, assumed it was a rock, and five seconds later found yourself knee-deep in a saber-toothed tiger's jaws, that would be the last mistake you ever made. Simply put, through successive generations of natural selection, those who assumed an inherently cautious view of the world were more likely to survive, and so the negativity bias trait, or as I like to call it, holy f nuggets, that's Mike Myers in my shitting bathroom. Uh, oh no, it's just a dressing gown. Endured, and as my dressing gown demonstrated last night, it still plagues our brains today. Modern science has confirmed negativity bias's existence. In one neurological study, participants were shown a series of positive, negative, or neutral images. The negative images triggered higher levels of electrical activity in the brain. This may not sound like a big deal, but this directly impacts the way we see the world and consequently behave. Negative events are much more salient and hence some people end up in therapy because they think their entire life is a train wreck, when in fact, 95% of it consists of positive experiences, only they're long forgotten at the expense of the negative. Do you ever find yourself ruminating over past events or worrying about what's going to happen in the future? Of course you do. Not because you're a psycho and should be watching this from a padded cell, although if you are, Here's a small tip. Find the really tall native looking bloke and tell him to throw a sink through the window. No, your past haunts you because you're human and your brain is pre-programmed to find the negative in everything. The thing is, this survival mechanism is just not as useful as it used to be. Unless you owe them a lot of money, you're unlikely to spend your days worrying about tigers. Instead, you'll be obsessing over the possibility of losing your relationships, your job, or your money. That might seem sensible. It may even motivate you to work harder and be less of a dick to people, but it's not going to bring you happiness or peace of mind. Because even when you think your mind is at rest, it isn't. Instead, you've got a non-stop house party going on between your ears. Thoughts and feelings continually dancing to lousy hip hop and playing beer pong. That's right, your brain gets invited to more exciting parties than you do. Neuroscientists have found the source of this is something they like to call default mode network. This is a large scale brain network primarily composed of the medial frontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, and the angular gyrus, which is sadly not as naughty as it sounds. Studies have shown that even when test subjects are apparently calm and at rest, the default mode network remains highly active, engaged in constant and random mental chatter. Some people call this monkey mind, 
which is probably quite offensive to monkeys, but at least a good description of how nuts this inner nattering is. Unfortunately, due to negativity bias, most of this internal chatter is quite unpleasant. Imagine an episode of Real Housewives, but instead of slagging off each other's husbands and tit jobs, it's all directed at you. It's exhausting, and it makes you feel crap. So what do you do? Well, here's a quote. After a heavy week at work, nothing helps me unwind like a long glass of water and some quality time dwelling on my mistakes. Do you know who said that? Nobody ever. When humans feel overburdened by the weight of daily life and the voice in their heads, they don't look for a way to check in. They look for a way to check out. To help explain what I mean, here's another quote, a real one this time, from George Bernard Shaw. Alcohol is the anesthesia by which we endure the operation of life. For George, it was alcohol. Maybe for you, it's electronic dance music, Instagram, illicit drugs, prescription drugs, porn, or yoga. Everyone has some way of getting out of their own head and accessing an altered state. Of course, some of these methods are healthier than others. I'm obviously not advocating drug use here. But the objective is always the same. Tune out of ordinary consciousness. In their book, Stealing Fire, authors Steve Kotler and Jamie Wheel calculate the altered state's economy, which is made up of many activities that people use to snap out of reality. They estimate it to be worth more than $4 trillion a year. That's big business. But it's also nothing new. Cultures all around the world have been experimenting with altered states for a long time. Possibly as far back as 30,000 years ago. Most of these activities were part of sacred rites and often involved hallucinogenic substances. Whilst you may enjoy a couple of beers on a Friday night, the Mayans took drinking to such an advanced level that they stopped drinking altogether. Instead, they took alcohol as an enema, usually mixed with other psychoactive substances, until they were totally pissed and as blissed out as it is possible to be so in a megalomanic, sacrificial Central American ancient civilization. Don't fancy chugging cocaine and green tea up your arse. Well, in Greece, the Eleusian Mysteries saw altered states elevated to a cult level eventually influencing the evolution of Western philosophy. For nearly 2,000 years, the mysteries promoted clandestine rituals that incorporated ecstatic dancing, fasting, and the consumption of a drink called kikion, all of which were designed to shift the initiate state of mind. Kikion, the barley-based elixir that was consumed at the climax of the process, had a profound effect on those who consumed it. Probably, it seems, because they were tripping off their damn faces. Modern anthropologists think that Kikion was made from barley that contained ergot, a parasitic fungus that commonly infects grains. Ergot releases ergometrine and delisergic acid amide, a chemical precursor to LSD. Other researchers believe that the Kikion recipe may rather have included magic mushrooms, which grew naturally in the area around Eleusis. Regardless of ingredients, this potion was potent enough to require hardcore protection. Revealing its secrets or drinking Kikion outside the Eleusian mysteries was punishable by death. It also stimulated the thinking of philosophical heavyweights like Socrates, Plato, and Pythagoras. That's right, the triangle guy. It turns out you were right all along. The guy who came up with those theorems really was on something. Whether you're talking about Kikion in Greece, peyote cactus in Central and North America, ayahuasca in South America, or iboga in Central Africa, altered state traditions have been around for thousands of years, typically intertwined with spirituality and culture. The pursuit of altered states is so fundamental that it transcends humanity. Dolphins have been documented getting stoned on pufferfish, African elephants get drunk on fermenting marula fruit. Cats can't resist catnip. Dogs lick toads to get high. Bees get stoned on orchid nectar. This behavior is so typical that UCLA psychopharmacologist 
which I swear just sounds like an excuse to combine two professions into one. Ronald Siegel once wrote, the pursuit of intoxication with drugs is a primary motivational force in the behavior of organisms. What? The desire to get high is a significant driver of human behavior? I thought it was money or sex or something, or sex with your money. That's a pretty radical suggestion anyway. Or is it? I know you might be saying, oh, I tried it once, but I never inhaled, or no thanks 42, I wouldn't touch the stuff. But don't you already have some vice that you use in your life to change your mood or mental state? Booze, cigarettes, sugar, coffee? Or maybe you prefer to use a healthier method like meditation, running, or drinking yak milk. Mm. But what you do is not as important as why. Most people are trying to change their state of mind because they're chasing pleasure or avoiding pain. But an increasing number of people are using altered states to go beyond feeling better to performing better. The best known example of this is the flow state. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, a psychologist who literally wrote the book on the subject, describes flow as a state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. Your concentration is so intensely focused on the task at hand that there's nothing left over for the monkey mind to scratch and nibble at. As a result, your problems recede entirely. You enter the zone, a state of tremendous productivity and creativity that feels timeless, selfless, and effortless. You can probably recall the time that you've tasted this, whether it was work, a hobby, creating something, or playing a sport. Most people have had at least one experience of being so immersed in something that hours went by without notice. When you thought back on it, it seemed like the head state you are in was not your usual pattern of remuneration, regret, reasoning, and other words starting with R. If you can recall such a time, you know that this state feels really, really good. That's one of the reasons that scientists have been studying flow and trying to understand how to trigger it. Other than feeling like the physical manifestation of Batman mixed with Jesus, Bat Jesus, another reason you'll want to achieve flow is that it's an optimal state for performance and productivity. You don't enter flow when drifting around on a lilo or scanning pictures of self-loathing morons on Instagram. How about watching thought-provoking YouTube videos presented by an antiquated Englishman? I hear you ask, I think. Well, I'd love to say yes, but what you're doing right now will only get you halfway to entering the fabled flow state. I am here to challenge your understanding of the world with new ideas and information. But Csikszentmihalyi's research shows that achieving flow relies on personal challenge and skill. The task you're doing needs to challenge you, but you also need to have just enough skill to do it. Too much difficulty without sufficient ability causes anxiety. Too much skill without enough of a challenge leads to boredom. No challenge and no required skill is called apathy. If you're in that state, be sure to check yourself regularly for a pulse and excess drool. Flow is an active state, which is why most of the studies done on the phenomenon have focused on athletes and extreme sports professionals. These test subjects report having hugely amplified access to pattern recognition, future prediction, and information processing capabilities. When in the zone or flow, you can make better decisions faster, faster even than conscious thought. Bizarrely, that's because during flow, the part of your brain usually in charge of decision-making, your prefrontal cortex, is temporarily bypassed. Why? Because it slows you down. And being in flow state is all about reacting and thinking at superhuman speed. During flow state, your brain is filled with a cocktail of neurochemicals that makes you feel alert and ecstatic. Norepinephrine heightens your concentration. Dopamine improves your cognitive alertness. Endorphins activate the opioid receptor, which, along with anandamide, brings on the feeling of bliss. 
serotonin lifts your mood. Finally, a good shot of oxytocin, the love hormone, leaves you with a sort of post-orgasmic glow that follows most flow episodes. If by now you think the flow state has a lot in common with the other non-ordinary states I mentioned earlier, such as the Mayan whiskey up your arse state, as I like to call it, you're not wrong. Feelings of bliss, expanded consciousness, higher creativity, connection with something greater. It turns out that these are universal qualities of heightened altered states, regardless of whether you enter them through psychedelics or big wave surfing. What I'm essentially saying is, you don't need drugs to get high. Mihail Csikszentmihalyi has even compared the flow state to tripping. In one interview, calling flow a kind of toned down ecstasy. But research into flow has revealed that altered states in general have more potential than weekend entertainment or conversations with Yoda. And these states can be hacked. Firstly, you have to get your mind right. Research by faculty at the University of Portsmouth found that instructing a group of rock climbers in positive psychology tools like goal setting, self-talk and mindfulness increased the intensity of their flow states, whilst also elevating personal performance. Try meditation, positive mindset development, cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise, and good sleep. And after that, you could channel Pink Floyd and tap into your brainwaves. There are five main brainwave frequencies. Gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Beta is where you spend most of your time whilst focused and alert. Alpha is where you're at when you're relaxed and open-minded, like when you're daydreaming. Theta is associated with more profound states of mind, like meditation. The flow state happens at the bridge between alpha and theta, when the mind is moving from the conscious into the subconscious. Similarly, scientists at Imperial College London's Centre for Psychedelic Research, yes, that's a thing, found people on the South American hallucinogenic plant, ayahuasca, had brain patterns resembling those of people who are awake in their dreams. Finally, more and more people use substances to nudge them in the right direction. No, I'm not proposing you drop three tabs of acid with your cornflakes on a Monday morning. I'm not even suggesting you microdose yourself with tiny daily amounts of psychedelics, as has become weirdly popular in Silicon Valley tech and other high pressure, high creativity industries. It seems that just focusing on good vitamins and nutrients, all made from totally legal ingredients of course, can support the optimal brain functioning needed to access these high performing states. Of course, the fact that you've watched this whole video confirms that you're already a peak stage champion. Go treat yourself to a biscuit and thanks for watching. What's that I hear you say? You want to experience my new book, stick a flag in it, but you can't be asked to read. I hear you. That's why you can now get the audiobook release of Stick a Flag in It over on Audible. You'll find the link in the description below. Thank you.